by the Roman law? The picture presented is in fact that of a man who has survived death on the cross and who, out of fear of being caught and put back on it, was hiding himself. This is further corroborated by the fact that Jesus quickly fled, quickly fled to the country of Galilee thereafter. It shows that he was running away, like any other man would have fled, from the country where he was persecuted to a place of safety. If his final act was to ascend to heaven, why need, what need was there to flee to Galilee? And moreover, why under the cover of night, seeking to remain inconspicuous? There seems to be no logical reason for this behavior as to why he needed to travel inconspicuously a distance of about 100 miles or thereabouts to another country just so that he could ascend to heaven. The eighth evidence is also taken from the post-crucifixion scene. Jesus, when he met his disciples, was still in that mortal body upon which he had been put on the cross. When he spoke to doubting Thomas, he showed him his wounds. Then he said to Thomas, Reach here with your finger and see my hands, and reach here with your hand and put it into my side. <clears throat> and do not be unbelieving, but believing. John chapter 20, verse 27. When his disciples thought him to be a ghost, he reprimanded them and emphatically told them that he wasn't a ghost, but had the same flesh and blood that he did before he was put on the cross, with his wounds still palpably visible. So as to further impress upon their minds that he was still in his mortal body and not in an immortal body, he ate bread and fish with them. Are these not the encumbrances of a mortal body? As Jesus had prophesied that the miracle of Jonah would be shown in his case, the miracle of Jonah being survival, not resurrection, so it came to pass. In short, both the pre-crucifixion scene and the post-crucifixion scene testify that Jesus survived his ordeal on the cross and did not die upon it. In today's world, thousands upon thousands of people who are pronounced medically dead, according to our far more advanced medical knowledge, seemingly come back to life. It is, however, called resuscitation, not resurrection. In other words, they had never actually died in the first place. Bear in mind that those who observed him on the cross and who believed that he had died were not medical authorities. They were simply Roman soldiers, and a few of his disciples with the medical knowledge available in the first century AD. If with today's methods of detecting clinical death, people who are pronounced seem to have lost my place. People who are pronounced dead are still revived. Why is this not applied to the case of Jesus, especially as the first century AD in relation to modern detection methods of clinical death were highly primitive? Indeed, it was necessary for the onlookers to the crucifixion to believe that Jesus had died. For if they had not believed so, they would have broken his legs in the same manner that the legs of the two thieves beside him had been broken, and so Jesus would most surely have died from hypovolemic shock. If we were to take the story of Jesus and transfer it to a modern day setting, the deductive process becomes far easier. We have the case of a man who is to be put to death by, let us say, lethal injection. There are witnesses to the execution, they see quite clearly that not all of the lethal chemicals are injected into him because he already seems to be dead. He is hurriedly handed over to his family. It is found later that the family had applied regenerative and healing treatments to his body. A few days later after the ex execution, he is seen weakly walking around, hiding from the authorities. When his friends see him, they t think him to be a ghost as they believe that he had died. The man emphatically rejects their assertion that he is a ghost and, as a proof, shows them his injection marks. To prove further that he is not a ghost, but is in the same body as before, he eats with them. If the government of today were to arrest him again and ask him how he was still alive, would it be a reasonable plea on his part to say that he had indeed died, but that he had risen from the dead? Would any jury in the world accept such a plea? The jury would cite the evidence that he had been not been given all of the lethal chemicals as he, had, as he had already seemed to be dead, and that he had been medically treated after being handed back to his family. Evidently, the jury would continue, the witnesses to the execution had mistakenly taken him to be dead, and had released him while he was still clinically alive. This is exactly the case of Jesus. Moreover, it was Jesus himself who said that his miracle was to, was to be the miracle of Jonah. Remember that the miracle of Jonah was survival, not resurrection. Yet the question that should be asked at this point is whether there is any new evidence in support of these arguments. Indeed, a weighty testimony 
has come to light. In 1873, a book was published in America entitled The Crucifixion by an Eyewitness. It was immediately withdrawn from publication almost as soon as it had appeared, and all the plates in the publishing house were destroyed. It was, however, supposed that it was supposed that all the published, copy, published copies of the book were also destroyed. Luckily, however, one particular copy found its way into the hands of a man in Massachusetts. His daughter found it many years later in 1907 and sent it to a friend of hers by the name of Florence Huntley, whom she knew was interested in such historical matters. He immediately realized its worth and made a number of inquiries regarding its initial publication in 1873. Mr. Huntley found that every record of the book had been destroyed. Indeed, even the official copies that were meant to be by the law of copyright found with the Librarian of Congress had also ominously disappeared. The original Latin manuscript from which Mr. Huntley found, from which the English translation was made in 1873 still, however, existed. After many inquiries, Mr. Huntley found that the original Latin manuscript existed in archives in Germany. He was, he was assured that it would there remain safe and secure from any type of vandalism. He republished the book in 1907. The original Latin letter from which the translation was made was found sometime in the 19th century in an excavation of an ancient house in Alexandria which was formerly occupied by Grecian friars. The house was proved from other archaeological discoveries made along with it to have been owned and occupied by a member of the Essene or Essir community, the two names being interchangeable. A little explanation is here required as to who the Essenes were. The Essene community were a religious order that existed in the time of Jesus, that act and indeed even before him, as there were the Pharisees and Sadducees, so too were there the Essenes. They were a religious sect in Judaism. It is interesting indeed that the Essene community is also acknowledged by all knowledgeable scholars as the authors of the Dead Sea Scrolls, written in 100 BC. It shows that this was a community that predated Jesus himself. The purpose of the order was that the members should develop in themselves purity, virtue, and wisdom to a high degree. But furthermore, they devoted themselves to the art of medicine and practiced it for the benefit of others. They were true communists and pulled a large majority of their gains into the common treasury. They were a strictly puritanical and almost an ascetic sect. Members of the order were divide, divided into four classes or degrees, indicating their place within the community. Members of the first or highest order were the most highly respected. Access to the higher orders could only be achieved through proving oneself through trials demanding purity and high morals. It was strictly forbidden for a member of the higher order to divulge any secrets to a member of the lower order. It was punishable by expulsion from the movement. According to this Latin letter excavated in Alexandria, Jesus was a member of this movement and had been so from a young age. His mother Mary was also a member of this movement. This letter, from which I am about to read an extract, was written by one member of the Essenes who lived in Jerusalem to a brother Essene who lived in Alexandria. The letter was written seven years after the events of the crucifixion. The author of the letter, in other words, the Essene who lived in Jerusalem, states that he was a close personal friend of Jesus and was present throughout the ordeal of the crucifixion and was an eyewitness to everything that went on, both before and afterwards in the sepulchre. I shall waste no more time now on detailing background information, but shall let you judge for yourself. I shall begin with Jesus as he is suffering on the cross. He is already cried out, and his head is slumped forward on his chin. The account of what occurs next is, I am sure you'll agree, remarkable. Now it so happened that after the earthquake and many of the people had gone away, Joseph and Nicodemus arrived at the cross. They were informed of the death of the crucified in the garden of our brethren, not far from Calvary, Calvary being where Jesus was crucified. Although they loudly lamented his fate, it nevertheless appeared strange to them that Jesus, having hung less than seven hours, should already be dead. They could not believe it and hastily went up to the place. There they found John alone, he having determined to see what became of the beloved body, John the Baptist. Joseph and Nicodemus examined the body of Jesus, and Nicodemus, greatly moved, drew Joseph aside and said to him, As sure as is my knowledge of life and nature, so sure is it possible to save him. But Joseph did not understand him, 
And he admonished us that we should not tell John the Baptist 